um, a slightly different uh, presentation from the last one, which I personally thought was quite interesting. Uh, we're a higher risk, but potentially much higher um, level of return. Um, but I would first like to say how pleased I am to be speaking to you in Manchester, because uh, Manchester is the home of the world-leading Cancer Research UK Manchester, Manchester Institute, which is the research arm of the Christie Hospital, which is Europe's largest cancer hospital. And uh, sitting here uh, next to where I was sitting is Jeb Brady, one of their leading researchers that's been uh, working for the last four years with Angle's uh, cancer system. So those of you who, who follow Angle will be able to ask uh, Jed some questions at the end if you would like to do so. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, explain to you how a pretty simple engineering solution is going to transform healthcare in the field of uh, cancer by providing precision medicine uh, to patients. And I'm going to explain why that's important, um, and then I'm going to uh, explain the opportunity for investors. Um, so if we start off... Whoops. Right, if we start off by a very, very simple uh, summary. These are the key points if you're an investor for, about Angle. If you remember these, then you've probably got the whole picture. Uh, we're offering a very, very simple blood test to enable precision medicine, which means to provide the right treatment to the patient at the right time. Um, we're focused um, primarily in cancer care, although there are actually some areas outside of cancer where our technology could be uh, deployed. Uh, the, our system is proven, um, and the Cancer Research UK is one of quite a number of major cancer centres around the world that have started to do research with our system and have demonstrated very, very strong results. The market is absolutely enormous. Uh, so the, the number there shown from Goldman Sachs is the tip of the iceberg just for the United States market. So it's a very major opportunity. Uh, and we're addressing this by obtaining a particular type of cell from blood called a circulating tumour cell. And I'm going to explain what that means and why it's important. But what it enables you to do is to look at the patient's cancer from a simple blood test. And that's the key. It's non-invasive. It, it can be repeated as often as you want, and it's low cost. And all of that can target treatment to make sure that a cancer patient gets the appropriate treatment uh, during their disease. Uh, from a business point of view, we have a product-based solution. I'm going to show you the consumable uh, in a second. So we sell instruments and we sell uh, one-time use consumables. So we have a scalable business. Almost everybody in this field uh, is a service lab-based business where uh, they process uh, blood samples in their own laboratory and send results out. Obviously, that's not scalable in the same way that providing a simple product solution is. Um, and the final point is that we have recently acquired a downstream technology, downstream of our Parsortix CTC system, uh, to enable us to analyze the cells. And that offers a very high performance downstream uh, uh, gene expression analysis technique at a low cost. So why, why is all of this relevant? Uh, well, the answer is that um, we would imagine that if several people had, for example, men who have prostate cancer, they would all have the same disease. But in point of fact, they don't. Uh, they have the disease in the same part of their body. And that's why a one-size-fits-all uh, approach to treatment doesn't work very effectively. Um, and so doctors want to investigate the individual patient's cancer. And they do that, uh, and the traditional way of doing that is via a biopsy. So they take a solid biopsy uh, from the uh, patient, uh, which involves just cutting some of the cancer out and analyzing it in the laboratory. And from that, important decisions can be made as to, first of all, is there any cancer present? Secondly, how aggressive is it? Thirdly, which drugs might be effective? Now, bear in mind, however, that the cancer changes over time, so that the results that come from that initial biopsy become outdated and they become incorrect, which is why, very sadly, we hear stories of friends who've had cancer, they've been treated, their tumour size has reduced, let's say, by 90%, and everybody thinks, well, that's great, we've, uh, this cancer's under control. But then, unfortunately, it gets out of control because this, the remaining 10% is not the same as the first 90%. And the doctors have no way uh, of finding out what that is. Because if you imagine it's breast cancer, a lump has been cut out, or maybe there's been a mastectomy. That's how the original biopsy is done. Um, but the tissue involved in that primary breast cancer is no longer there because it's been surgically cut out. So you can't do another biopsy, even though the patient still has uh, cancer. So what you'd like to do is all of this. 
a liquid biopsy. Uh, so that means uh, getting cells or other cancer tissue from the patient's blood in order to analyze them. So, uh, and, and then when you, if you could do that, you could do a biopsy whenever you wanted, a liquid biopsy from a simple blood test. So why, why is it that a breast cancer patient or a prostate cancer patient might have cancer cells in their blood? It's not a blood disease as such. Um, and the reason is that the way cancer spreads is that the original tumor drops cancer cells into the bloodstream and they circulate. And if they land somewhere else, that's how you get a secondary cancer. So that's why people start with breast cancer and then they end up with liver cancer or bone cancer or brain cancer or lung cancer. It's because the original tumor has dropped cancer cells into the bloodstream and they've circulated and landed somewhere else and caused a new cancer in a different location. And 90% of people who, over 90% of people who die from cancer die from their secondary cancers, not from their primary. So these cells are the, are the key. Uh, just get a hold of those cells. They're the ones that are spreading the cancer. Have a look at them. Work out the best treatment. Sounds very, very simple, doesn't it? The challenge, however, is that there's hardly any cells there's present, very, very rare numbers of cells. So in, in, in a, a thousand million blood cells, there might be one, two, five. So it's an extremely difficult technical challenge to actually get hold of those cells. Um, now, we have developed a, a technology which can solve that. And I'm holding up a one-time use Parsodix cassette. We can show you that uh, in the drinks bit. It's actually a very simple piece of plastic. That's what I mean by an engineering solution to a very difficult medical problem. Because the cancer cells that are in the patient's bloodstream, it just so happens that they're significantly larger than all of the blood cells, and they're less compressible. So we have got a very clever piece of uh, polycarbonate plastic here. It's cost millions and millions to develop, but it doesn't cost much to make it now it's been developed. Um, and that has the potential, the capability of capturing these cancer cells. And so here is an animation showing how the system works. The blood goes in through the inlet and it flows down these channels. The channel's closed at the end, so it's forced to go left or right in order to flow out. And if you look at the um, cross-section here, there's a series of steps. So the red and white blood cells go up those steps and there's a tight gap. They slide <coughs> through that gap and they float out into the waste. However, the cancer cells, which are larger and less compressible, are held gently in the final gap. And they can't get through because they're too large and not compressible enough. So once they're held in that position, um, we, we can just reverse flow and take them back out again. So you end up taking them out without the presence of the blood cells or with only a very small number of blood cells left. So I'm now going to show you under a, mi a microscope what actually happens in real life in inside one of our um, cassettes. Right, okay, so this is a live blood flowing inside one of these cassettes. Uh, and what we're looking at there is the lines are the edges of these steps. So it's going up the staircase, and uh, this is basically the outlet trench. They see the blood streaming through, up the steps and through there, and then into the outlet trench. But there is a captured cancer cell. So it's just sitting there stationary, and all the other blood cells are scooting either side of it. It doesn't clog up, and you end up with all these actually quite large cells sitting on the final step. So that's the staircase, that's the top step, and that's the critical gap. And that's where they always end up. Uh, so it's a really super simple technology. Um, but the great thing is it's fully patented worldwide. So Angle owns this worldwide. Nobody else can copy this approach. And what that does is it opens up lots of different um, applications. So here we have the Parsodix instrument. So this is a, uh, essentially it's a machine that we've designed specifically to run the blood uh, through one of those cassettes. So the cassette here is put into a clamp. That's a standard blood tube. Uh, it can be, there's all sorts of different blood uh, stability tubes, but that particular one is an EDTA tube. So a standard one, the blood's drawn into that tube. The user just takes the top off the tube, attaches it to the instrument, hits go, and the instrument will automatically push the blood through one of our cassettes into waste. And then the user can either use these tubes here, and if they wanted to, they could stain the cells inside this cassette, which as you would see is the same size as a microscope slide. So you can actually look at the cells straight inside the Pasodix cassette. Or, which is, often, which is usually the case, um, they use the harvest valve in order to get the instrument to flow um, the cells out in the reverse direction. And that leaves the user with the cancer cells, which might be 20 to 50 cancer cells, sitting in a small amount of liquid, 200 microliters of liquid. 
and in a form that then can be analysed with multiple downstream gene expression technologies and so forth, which can provide the answers to the key questions that the doctors want to ask uh, with a biopsy. Um, in terms of um, our new downstream analysis technique, we bought in November, completed a transaction buying all the assets of a Canadian company, uh, which has we'd proven in our ovarian cancer study in the United States was very, very good at doing multi multiplex gene expression analysis. Basically means looking at a lot of gene expression information on a small number of cells. And when we realized how good it was, uh, we got an opportunity to buy it and we bought it. Now, what that means is that Angle is moving now towards a sample to answer solution. So all the way from the blood sample through to the gene expression information. And what that does is increase the, the profit margin that we can make on the sales and increase the value add that uh, we're able to um, hold on to. Now, this is also subject to multiple granted patents. Um, and it also consists of an instrument and a one-time use consumable. All those elements are quite important to the uh, commercial rationale. But in a nutshell, uh, what this Ziplex system can do is multiplex gene expression similar to targeting next-generation sequencing. You'll have heard of companies like Illumina, for example, at much, much lower cost, about a tenth the cost. Uh, so we think it, it really offers an opportunity to um, uh, change the market. In terms of the um, potential for our, our technology, there are numerous things you can do once you've actually got the cells. Uh, so basically, you can detect the presence of cancer. Uh, you can work out uh, which drugs would be most appropriate for an individual patient at a particular time. You can uh, assess whether they still have disease. It, uh, Ironically, when patients are being treated, one of the hardest decisions is when to stop treatment. In other words, has the chemo worked and can we stop giving these toxic um, side effect drugs or do we need to keep going? And actually, one of the big things is uh, remission monitoring. There's a major opportunity there because patients who are in remission, at the moment, there are, there's very little scientific way of assessing whether they've got a potential to relapse. The way that patients relapse in cancer is because the, the Circulating tumor cells, or actually they're then called DTCs, are sitting in the bone marrow and something releases them and that's how it's thought that secondary cancers are caused. Um, so if we could actually have a blood test to assess whether that's happening ahead of it happening, that could be a very big advantage. Uh, can you just, sorry, is that the amount of time for the presentation or is that? Yeah, presentation. presentation, not questions. Right, okay. Uh, I don't want to miss out on the questions. So um, in ovarian cancer, we have um, completed two 200-patient studies. Uh, both of them finished uh, last year, and we're optimizing a, uh, a test in the detection of ovarian cancer for women with an abnormal pelvic mass. And what that means is uh, women who have been uh, have already surgically it's been detected they've got a growth and they have to have surgery. 10% of these women will have ovarian cancer. 90% won't. Uh, what we've been, um, done in two 200 patient studies is we've shown that the use of past sortics can actually detect the presence of these ovarian cancer cells. And this is incredibly important because women with ovarian cancer have to have absolutely expert uh, cancer surgeon do their operation, otherwise they have a bad outcome. Uh, alternatively, the 90% have got a benign growth. That could be keyhole surgery done in their local hospital. It doesn't have to be a rush. But terribly, uh, it's not a, there's no effective way of working out who's who. So what we're looking for is a blood test to determine in advance whether the woman is high risk of having the ovarian cancer or whether she's much more likely to have a benign. And what we showed is the ability to massively outperform all the current tests on the market to do, to do this particular application, including a 95% uh, sensitivity in detecting the presence of ovarian cancer through a simple blood test prior to surgery and double or nearly double the sensitivity of the existing blood test, so a specificity, sorry, which is to detect correctly those women who have a benign um, growth. So ovarian cancer is a major area of focus for Angle. Um, in the healthcare industry, um, I'm afraid we, we're all sitting in the UK, but actually everything's driven by the Americans, which is a bit annoying for the rest of us. Um, but in terms of uh, getting assessment of how good is a, is a healthcare product, the FDA, which is the Food and Drug Administration in the United States, is the gold standard. So an FDA clearance for a medical instrument and uh, consumable like ours is the absolute um, stamp of approval that you, you can get. There is no company in the entire world that has got an FDA clearance for harvesting cancer cells 
from blood for, an, for subsequent analysis. We're seeking to be the first company to get that. And the key is that we can get the cells out for downstream analysis. Um, so we've been working actually for several years towards this aim. Uh, I was delighted um, last month to announce with our interims that we had actually signed institutional review board um, approval with the first two large cancer centres who were undertaking an FDA study for us. Uh, and that's taken us, like I say, several years of effort to get to that point. Um, and we're, we're undertaking a 400-subject trial, so that's 200 metastatic breast cancer patients and 200 matched healthy volunteers of a similar age and demographic with the intention of proving, uh, independently proven by these American cancer centres, that they can get the cells from these patients' bloods and they can be analysed. And if we get the stamp of approval from the FDA, then obviously we'll be in a, uh, in a position of uh, the only one in the market that can do that. And interestingly here, MD Anderson uh, in particular is the uh, leading cancer centre in the whole of the United States, and they have taken on the role of leading our, our cancer study in breast cancer. Um, we've had some tremendous work done by the University of Rochester Cancer Centre, and uh, they have shown that analysing cells um, from breast cancer patients using whole genome analysis, they can get the same information from a blood test for 192 genes and 66 druggable pathways um, compared to what they would get from a biopsy of a metastatic site. So, like I say, it, uh, breast cancer patient her disease has spread. The only way to get any tissue for analysis is to do an invasive biopsy. So it might involve general anaesthetic and cutting out part of her liver in order to find out uh, what's happening with those cancer cells. So what this lady is doing is pioneering the approach of just using a blood test instead. And obviously that is an absolutely gigantic market. <coughs> and it's one of the first things that we'll be seeking to do once we've got our FDA clearance in uh, breast cancer. Uh, we're also working in uh, prostate cancer. Um, and uh, that's with Bart's Cancer Institute. Um, they've shown that they can use the Angles Parsautic system to detect the presence of prostate cancer um, through a blood test. Now, that's really important because uh, the prostate um, biopsy, which is the way of doing it, um, the invasive way of doing it, basically eight out of ten men who have a prostate biopsy didn't have cancer in the first place. And that's because the PSA test, which is the blood test, is very non-specific, so it gets a lot of false positives. Um, but much more importantly than that, uh, they've used our system to analyze the cells that come out of, of parasortics to assess whether the disease is aggressive. Now, um, I'm sure amongst us we've, we've got friends uh, or family who, who've either had or currently have prostate cancer. The big question is, <laughs> is that it an aggressive cancer, which might kill the patient in a relatively short amount of time, or is it actually a much slower burn indolent disease, which they might live with for 30 years without any impact on their lifestyle? And yet, it, without that knowledge, they will likely take fairly aggressive treatment. So that's what uh, th this chap down at Bart's has been um, pioneering. And they did some work which showed looking at the cells from parasortics, they were ab able to identify a high risk versus a low risk group in advance, studied them for 20 months, the high-risk group um, predicted with our system was 10 times more likely to be dead than the ones uh, that were low risk. So obviously, that's, that works for both sides of the equation. Um, so basically, if a patient is low risk, then maybe they don't need the treatment. There's a problem with over-treatment in cancer, and it's often forgotten about. Um, um, whereas if they're high risk, then obviously you need to treat as soon as possible. I'm going to jump over a few of these slides just to tell you uh, we are into corporate partnerships. We signed a deal with Kyogen, which is one of the world's leading molecular um, uh, testing companies. And uh, we've subsequently, to this slide, we've signed deals with Philips and also with Abbott. So part of our model is that we uh, partner up with these big companies so that they can be our go-to-market approach. Um, and, uh, well, well, we'll come back to that. In terms of finances, we have got very modest uh, research use sales at the moment, but that's beginning to grow much more quickly. Margins at about 70% is very, very good. We've been investing very heavily. Fortunately, we, we've got some strong uh, shareholder support. So you can see, perhaps you can't see at the back of the room, but basically we've got some leading institutional investors such as Jupiter, Legal in General, Fidelity, who are all invested in the company and, uh, uh, and all of them. Uh, followed their money in our recent fundraise where we raised 15 million. So post, post the numbers here, where, where we had cash of 
4.2 million at 31st of October. We've raised a further 15 million. There was a little bit of overlap between those. So we're, we're, we're well resourced to complete these studies in the, um, uh, with the FDA and so forth. I'm going to stop now and move into uh, questions, if that's okay. Um, can, can we put up the last slide? I was going to leave the last slide hanging. I was wondering whether the, um, at what point, if somebody has cancer, is it identified? I mean, we're doing blood, you're doing blood tests on, on where people are, uh, are suspected of having cancer, but I'm just wondering whether it can be taken at a, at a much earlier stage. And I'm just wondering, you know, whether you're also using the facilities of the UK Biobank to actually, um, you know, uh, assess the, the, the samples that, are, that, that they, they have got. Right. I'll answer that. Yeah, Jed's yeah, so, a world expert, we, so I better, we, I better we are, seed. We are starting to look at that. So most of what we've done is examining patients where we know they've got cancer yeah. and trying to work out how to best treat them and to monitor, as Andrew said, when the disease comes back. Picking it up before you get a CT scan or any other diagnosis is very difficult because the numbers we've been talking about here actually are 0 to 20 in a, a blood draw in a patient who has cancer. What we don't know is when do we first see the CTCs of any sort in a blood of somebody who is just getting cancer and would just be detectable by a CT scan. Now we're trying to do things like that at CIUK Manchester, but we need to do many, many, we need to do more patients. On it. In fact, they're not patients at that point, they're healthy individuals. You have to start screening healthy individuals. And the problem with that is you have to deal with a, a big signal to noise or there's a possibility you'll be picking up false positives along the way. So the, the short answer is it's possible, but it needs a lot more work to establish moving it back that early. And, and what I'd probably add is as a commercial company, um, we're going to work with our collaborators for them to do that earlier stage screening. We need to focus on you know how we commercialise our technology and generate uh, revenues and returns for the investors. So... They're See? big studies, very early stage, work with our collaborators. Yeah, what about the UK Biobank? It's got the problem is with the UK Biobank, they collect samples with a very strict SOP to guarantee everything works properly, but the way they collect the blood samples isn't retrospectively applicable to devices like Parsortex or some of the other things we want to do. We are working with them to look at uh, tumour DNA that's in the blood, so not cells, but bits of tumour that end up in the blood and we're working out ways of uh, looking at their blood collection um, uh, system and, and ensure that we can at least pick up on molecules, DNA molecules that have come from the tumour in the blood samples that are part of the, the, the UK biobank. But the problem is in order to make sure that the cells can be put through this it is much more difficult, much more labour intensive than a simple blood draw which is what UK biobank is, is traditionally doing in terms of banking samples before analysis. Can I just very quickly ask a supplementary? We, we all have blood tests from time to time, yep. and they're only actually uh, being tested for certain things. Yep. I mean, is there a way of, of getting some multi-testing you know, system so that you know, it, it could be a comprehensive look that, at That's what we're aiming for. So that's a large part of what I've been doing for the last seven years here at the uh, CRUK Manchester Institute, is I've been working with a lot of companies actually, not just Power Sortex, but across the board to maximise the amount of information we can get from a single blood sample. So what was appealing about Power Sortex, and when we worked out we've been with you for four or five yeah, years now. Way, got Sorry, I've got, blue, I've got a blue smudge on my face. Um, it is, uh, we want to get as much information as possible, not just the cells, but the, pl the plasma, which gives us protein, it gives us uh, RNA molecules, DNA molecules, there's a lot you can tell from that. And, and actually, the way we use the power sortex device is to separate out the cells, put those through the power sortex, and then take the remaining component of the blood for, for different analysis. So we're basically trying to get as much information as we can from that single blood sample, and we're trying to figure out ways of banking everything. So if, if you're forced to do a, a very expensive assay on all of your samples from the blood, then it becomes impractical because often you don't need to do all of them. So what we're working at is a way of taking the blood, separating it out, sticking it in the freezer, and then analyse it when we need to do it. 
uh, and so we're working towards what you want, basically. I'll, I'll just add a couple of words before we get the next question to, to what, Jed, one more. <laughs> what, Jed, what Jed was saying, is that um, from, from a corporate perspective, this is a perfect example of our key opinion leader program. So Jed leads a team of people who are the leading experts in this field and they're exploring all kinds of things. What we've done is given them a tool that they can use. As a company, obviously, we're focused on trying to have how to get commercial returns as fast as possible. So if we focus on the easy bits, if you like, and uh, uh, sounds easy, but the, high, the higher risk group people, so with the ovarian cancer, it's women who are known to have an abnormal pelvic mass and they have to have surgery. And that's much easier to prove whether you're correct or not because two weeks later they have the surgery and they know the answer, did they have cancer or did they not? Whereas if you have healthy people, which I think you were thinking about, it's very difficult to prove whether you're right or wrong if you say, yes, they've got cancer or no, they haven't. One more question. Thank you, very interesting. What's your best guess for time of FDA approval? Um, so, <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, well, I can tell you the bits that we, we're seeking to control. I mean, obviously, we're trying to accelerate the process as fast as possible. First thing is to get the IRB approval, so Institutional Review Board approvals from the cancer centres to run the study. We've got two of those already. Uh, the next thing is to enrol the 400 subjects and to have them processed with Parsortics. And that, that is planned to be completed, according to our interims, by the, uh, within H2 of this year, so second half of 2018. In reality, we're targeting the middle, targeting the middle of the year, so we're hoping that in sort of June, June July time that, that'll be done. After that, uh, there's a submission to the FDA, and then there's their process of, of scrutiny and questions. And we're hoping that this time next year we'll, be, uh, we'll, we'll have got that sorted. But obviously it's outside of our gift. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.